Tim Marzullo. We're here at SFN 2019, and we have a live demonstration going on behind us. Uh, somebody trying out your stuff, and uh, they're laughing really hard. Is this a typical thing? Yeah, the human-human interface uh, has been a popular invention for years. Uh, people just love this idea of one person controlling another person. I think many friendships have been formed due to this invention. So, or friendships, friendships lost because you're kind of zapping people. Uh, yeah, you're creating a connection, you know, a real connection between people. You know, so. Is that like sex? <laughs> uh, I think it's that could also be considered another type of connection. So sure, maybe okay. it's a precursor. Who okay. knows? Yeah. Is that is that allowed here on the SFN floor? I need to look at the bylaws. I'm not really sure <laughs> what, how uh, how they view procreation dur during the uh, the conference, but uh, we yeah. can we can ask them. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Anyways, Tim Marzula here of Backyard Brains. You're showing me. We had you on the show a few years ago, two uh, years ago, uh -huh. and uh, really cool stuff. And, but you have some new stuff to show us this year. Yeah. What do you have to show us? Yeah, so Backyard Brains historically focuses on recording from neurons, muscles, heart tissue, so nervous and, and the, the nervous and the muscular system. But plants also use electrical signaling, which many people do not know. We used to look at a plant as this sort of static thing that grows slowly, but inside the plant there's all this electrical signaling going on, and we have an invention called the plant spiker box. And we have an experiment set up right here where we have the very famous uh, Venus flytrap. And I have a signal electrode just placed alongside of the trap. And we have a ground electrode. And where do you think the ground is, Layden? The ground. Yes, we have <laughs> grounded the ground in the ground. So, so inside the Venus flytrap are three trigger hairs. And if a fly touches the trigger hairs twice, within 20 seconds, the trap will close around the unfortunate fly. And the way that this works molecularly is that when a fly touches a trigger hair, an action potential uh, is uh, elicited inside the trap. And thus, if two action potentials occur within 20 seconds, that starts the, the trap closing. So we actually have it set up, and so I'm just gonna touch one of the trigger hairs here, um, right on the, the trap, so let's see. Okay. And then we have this on video too, so you can probably look Whoa! all along. <laughs> a beautiful, perfect action potential existence. You saw it here first. You saw it here first, uh, listeners of the Neural Implant Podcast. Plants have action potentials too. Wow. Now they don't have enough nerve systems, but you do use electrical signaling similar to the neurons in our own bodies. Very cool. Yeah. So the people who are only listening, uh, we have a beautiful spike, like really, like perfect, perfect spike. You know, depolarization down, up, boom. Very, very good. Like, but it's three seconds long instead of one millisecond wow. long as a neuron. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have to wait 20 seconds. Otherwise, it would close. So, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe evolutionarily, the, the Venus flytrap has this. So if a drop of water falls in there, it doesn't close. <laughs> yeah. To avoid false positives like wind hitting it. So I often tell people who are thinking about studying plant electrophysiology is that if they want an instant nature paper or an instant science paper, figure out how the trap is counting to 20. So we don't know molecularly how the plant is counting the time in between X potentials. There must be some sort of integration mechanism, but it's been a question since the days of Darwin. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so you basically had set up, where did you set up the spiker box? So, uh, what part, I mean, just, just to the back of the, the plant or how did you set this up? Yeah. So, um, the thing with doing electrophysiology is always the interface. Where do you put your electrodes? So. Uh, with the Venus flytrap, we it's actually quite easy. We just have a little plastic stick in the ground, and at the end of the stick is um, the end is wrapped with silver wire, and the end wrapped with silver wire is just placed alongside the side of the trap, and then we just put conductive gel around the silver wire so that there is a uh, continuous interface between the, the leaf and the silver wire on the stick. Wow. Silver wire on a stick. Silver the wire on a stick. The most advanced electrode here at the conference. That's... <laughs> That's pretty cool. So yeah, this is pretty. I mean, this is this is kind of aimed towards high school students, uh -huh. and uh, obviously the teachers would probably be doing these experiments. Uh -huh. So this isn't something that'd be too complicated for them. Or the learning curve is pretty easy, right? Like how how long does it take to train somebody to do this? Oh, it's just, it's it, you know, I just set it up, you know, in thirty seconds while you're setting up your video. So it is a popular um, experiment. Uh, students like experimenting on plants. It's not as complicated as doing experiments on insects or, or humans. And also, uh, I remember we had a customer who was an anesthesiologist. And was working with his son, and they were putting various substances um, in a in a dish um, around which the pot was placed in, and so they were using ethanol and other types of anesthetic agents to see whether that affected the uh, action potential generation. And so anesthetic agents do affect action potential generation, which is weird because you think in a plant, in a plant, yeah, yeah, weird, yeah, it's super weird. It's super so like it's it's a, I mean that's such a basic evolutionary trait yeah. that, that it 
all things affected. Yeah, wow. yeah. So the anesthetic, some anesthetic agents that affect humans also affect uh, the at least the action potential, action potential generation in the plant. I mean, that sounds like a paper right there. That's yeah, something. Yeah. That's yeah. something a high school student could do potentially yeah. with this equipment, right? Yeah, yeah. We have some win plant. some science fair. <laughs> yeah, I know. So the thing about backyard brains is uh, people are winning science fairs with our equipment, which obviously makes us uh, pretty excited. So. That's awesome. That's really cool. So really, this isn't like a new. Um, oh, this is. Oh, this is the plant-based sp uh, spiker box. So this is like uh, designed around plants. How is that different than a human one? It's that the because the action potential is so slow, uh, we have the filters a lot uh, slower, you know, 0 0.07 hertz to, you know, 50 hertz, whereas in the neuron spiker box, we have our filters much higher. And actually, the gain is much lower. Um, that that um, extracellularly recorded action potential in the plant is around uh, 20 to 50 millivolts, if I remember correctly, in the tens of millivolts at least. And so our amplifier is only amplifying the signal about 70 times, whereas in our human and our neuron physiology amplifiers, we have about 1,000 to 11,000 X amplification. So the issue when we first started doing experiments is that we kept swapping our amps because we didn't know that the signal is actually quite quite large in a plant. Uh, yeah. Why is that? Why is it so big? I don't know. <laughs> another science paper. Yeah, another science paper, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, is this uh, is this this is one of the biggest things? This has been very popular for you guys over the last few years. Yeah. Um, presumably, my theory is people don't want to like rip off the legs off the cockroaches and you know measure their action action potentials. Yeah. But you know, Venus flytrap, nobody cares if it closes, right? Or yeah. if you rip that apart. It, yeah, you know, yeah. We well, yeah. If, if you cut a leaf off, the leaf will grow back. <laughs> you know? Yeah. In the, in the leg, if you take a leg off of a cockroach, the leg will grow back. But I think it's even funnier, you know, uh, that yeah, people don't really have a problem cutting 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 leaves of plants. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so. This is, um, you know, obviously for, for high school students, but I think what's really important and, and will be really good is if uh, graduate students, you want wanting to do outreach, learning if they like teaching, if they do this. So, so basically, we, we did this actually as well. You know, I was in the Kevin Otto Lab at University of Florida, and we went to a high school. We just did some, you know, demonstrations or something like this and showing, uh, I don't know, material strengths or something like this. Uh, but uh, how could a graduate student, how could a PhD student use this box to uh, do outreach at high school. So the issue is that um, no one here at Backyard Brains is a plant physiologist. I mean, we're slowly becoming plant physiologists. We get so many questions all the time about how plants work, but our principal focus is in neurophysiology. Um, and so we only have two experiments on the Venus flytrap and a sensitive mimosa, which the sensitive mimosa is that plant that closes its leaves when you touch it. And so we, we study rapid movement plants. There's also a telegraph plant whose leaves slowly twitch uh, during the day and so people are starting to investigate other types of plants and because there was a science paper three weeks ago with calcium imaging uh, a, a signal propagating through the plant and uh, it's a big unknown actually how these electrical signaling in plants work so the equipment only costs about uh, let me see the price list yeah 149.99 and so a graduate student uh, if they so, so wished could build their own lab and actually do their own experiments, which makes us kind of excited because when I was a grad student, I had to go to my PI's lab to do experiments. That's why I went to grad school. That's why you are in grad school. But now we're seeing people can actually, oh, I want to study electrophysiology. Just buy a kit and start doing your own experiments. Well, similar to amateur astronomy. No one, you can get a PhD in astronomy and become a professional astronomer, or you can just buy a telescope and keep your day job as a electrical engineer or a banker or a doctor and still contribute to the field. That's really cool. Or, I mean, you know, also validate some ideas. You know, be like, oh, I, I have this idea. I want to try this out uh -huh. and to see if it's, you know, works or not. So yeah. I think that's another way to do it. But uh, I think that's, that's really cool. I mean, like, a lot of people can, um, you know, Maybe even ask their PI like to fund this to to be able to say like hey I want to do this uh, could you pay for this biker box you know and I want to do this outreach and uh, I don't know what, what do you think about this I mean that's also the barrier to entry so if I study um, if I'm in a genetics lab or um, you know a, a development lab but I don't do any electrophysiology um, maybe your PI would be resistant to spend ten to twenty thousand dollars on equipment just to do exploratory research. But our our, our equipment is all priced at consumer grade. You can see all those prices are between 140 and 200 to 250 dollars. So you could use kind of discretionary funding just to collect ex exploratory data for a grant. And if you actually get some nice results, then you could. Um, <laughs> people are laughing around us. What's going on? Okay. <laughs> she was yelling at the Venus flytrap, and that's what happened. Oh no! You did you close it? No, it's not done. Happening is the Mellon Jones doesn't think we're doing. Now because there's because 
or I just whispered into the radio show, but I'll, I'll out it because I think the, the, uh, the trap is moving against the electrode. And so that interface is being disrupted. So it's just a mechanical artifact. So I, I apologize. Um, but there was a brief moment where maybe we thought we had discovered something revolutionary in the Neural Living Plant podcast, you know. You heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. Plant ears. Yeah, plant ears. But I apologize, listeners. We did not, um, we did not discover a new phenomenon. We only discovered artifacts. The bane of electrophysiology. Huh? Yeah, it's weird. It's the same amplitude. It's, it's, it's designed to trick you. I thought it was just like part of like cutting. Well, plants do sense their environment, and they do sense damage. So uh, there could be a mechanism for that. You know, well, when when uh, there was a science paper, I think five years ago, where they cut a tomato plant and showed an electrical potential propagating it through the whole plant. And I think what was happening, and I my memory is a bit foggy, is that the plant began upregulating natural pesticides because it knew it was under attack. So there's a whole. We look at plants as these kind of slowly moving, slowly growing things, but there's a whole molecular electrical world inside that's only just now beginning to be understood and appreciated. I'm on the radio, which is why I'm speaking in a very form, very formal voice. So I suppose. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're hot. We're, we're hot mics, you know. <laughs> we'll see. I'll see if I keep this up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're also on video, too. Oh, great. All right. Yeah, you're on video, too. <laughs> Whisper, uh, singing to plants. So oh that's that's how you're gonna be remembered. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. That is actually very cool. Like you could have a bunch of these, like in a like what you were saying in in a, in a row, and like measure the propagation, right? Like could you could you attach a bunch of these? I mean, I guess a Venus flytrap is really small, but but uh. Yeah, I, I do think. Um, and again, I'm not a plant physiologist, so if there's plant physiologists listening to this, to this podcast, I apologize. You know, this is at the limits of my knowledge, but I think there are studies where trees will announce threats to other trees of the same species in the area. That there's a bug coming, and then maybe some odorant is released into the air that then is a communication sing signal to other trees to to um, to express certain natural pesticides. I'm just speculating, so yeah. uh, but there are there's a lot of things going on in plant physiology that. Uh, just now beginning to learn about very cool, yeah. very cool. then well, the uh, plant implant podcast implant implant implants and plants implants and plants oh we got it we got it okay. boom yeah. that's uh that's the spin-off for this yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. very cool uh -huh. is there anything else that you want to mention any other uh new toys in the last few years that you guys have developed or uh any, any yeah yeah that? so it's still kind of early in the morning hello oh, yeah. hey how you doing um but uh when uh, the, the muscular guy with the muscle shirt on is our education and uh, sales uh, liaison, uh, Will Wharton, and he hacked together yesterday a World of Warcraft interface where he had nine electrodes attached to different muscles on his body and was playing World of Warcraft. And so that was obviously driving, drawing a big crowd. So we do the fundamental physiology, but then we have fun playing with uh, interfaces. Oh, so we have some new uh, claws. We have a, we never were able to hook up the synthesizer, but we have a drum machine over there and you can actually make uh, drum loops by flexing muscles. So that's kind of the new <laughs> Dang, that's really cool. Yeah. How do you play World of Warcraft with the... You, um, you can set up, uh, you can, we have um, a Leonardo uh, which can be Arduino Leonardo, which can become a keyboard for your computer. So you can actually, within the Arduino code, say that this, uh, you can command the Leonardo to touch key A, key B, key up, down. You can map out what is going to set key 1, key 2, key 3. So then you're just translating the muscle amplitudes from different muscle subgroups into keystrokes. So, yeah, yeah. so you could actually type, do whatever. Yeah. This is really cool. I mean, this is literally is like, you know, you're doing lab level stuff uh -huh. and a high school student could throw yeah. this together like a clever high school student yeah. could clean up on, uh -huh. on the, the you know the science fair i i wouldn't be surprised i mean that'd, that'd be kind of cool if like half the science fairs even the national science fairs are like your guys stuff yeah <laughs> maybe maybe it's already starting to happen this is in grad school you know if you want to make a, a an, an interface you'd buy this expensive equipment do something weird in lab view and matlab and you'd, it took a lot of training but now with the, uh, the arduino microcontroller and a lot of the other kind of uh, low-cost open source tools that are coming out it's getting easier and easier just to be creative and, and investigate uh, neurophysiology which is what we're excited about very cool yeah. very cool well thanks tim thanks tim again this is really cool and uh yeah I, I'm, I'm looking forward to what you guys well thanks uh thanks for coming to our booth and uh i'm not all i'm not only uh a neuroscientist 
on your show. I'm also an avid listener, so uh, um, I've listened to some of our colleagues like Kevin Otto um, and Doug Weber uh, and TK and then Jennifer French, so I'm looking forward to hearing more of uh, the community contribute to your podcast. I'm always happy to hear that. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.